Once upon a time, there were only movies, TV, and books to entertain the masses. But times have changed. When you're actually able to have control and manipulate this virtual world in front of you, it, it just feels good. Yet video games strive for something beyond control. The perfect story. Here's the situation. Another member of the science team's gone missing. I think there isn't a game that wouldn't be made better by a good story and good characters. Sonny, they shot my phone. Maybe there's an opportunity to combine storytelling with the I dive in and make choices, which is what defines games. But there is still one vital story element to come. Emotion. Lord Baker! Thank you. Can a computer game make you cry? Once you've answered that question in the affirmative, then I think that there's no reason for everybody not to be playing video games. Presented by Best Buy, where this holiday, the wow's guaranteed. The late 70s was the beginning of the golden age of arcade games, with pellet-popping Pac-Man and relentless alien invaders. Video games allowed the players to control their own digital experience. But if this new form of entertainment was going to last, Game designers knew they needed what TV and movies already had, a story. I think in the very beginning with video games, uh, what, what you had with a lot of them was a very simple technical mechanic like Pong where, okay, I'm rotating this dial and it's moving a paddle and here comes this ball and there's a little bit of physics involved. But, that, but it's not really about anything. It's just an amusement. In order to keep players entertained, Game designers realized that, like filmmakers, they had to connect with the player on a deeper level. So for games to get from the level of just being a, a fun activity, kind of like Pong, to a true uh, entertainment that is competitive with film and book and so on, uh, then games have to cross the threshold and also touch us in the ways that story does with you know, an emotional response, with characters we actually can care about and get involved with. In the late 1970s, a breakthrough film combined intense sci-fi action with a dramatic story. Luke Skywalker's journey was a call to greatness and a chance for one man to effect great change. Taking a first step into a larger world. It's an ageless theme, inspired by Joseph Campbell's classic text, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Star Wars really showed off that kind of storytelling with a kind of a fast-paced panache, really, with, with all this great technology and all these great special effects that didn't detract from the story. And the influence can still be felt in video games. The mind-blowing special effects in Star Wars drew people into the movie theaters. You don't believe in the Force, do you? But in the virtual world, video games were still nothing more than idle play toys. Even successful titles like Asteroids and Space Invaders paled in comparison to the film-going experience. And when Star Wars was igniting theater screens uh, all over the world, gaming was really in its infancy. And so I think the video game industry really was struggling with making these games work in the first place, exploring how to use controls in video games. And, you know, at the, t at the time, story just wasn't, wasn't something you put into your games. So video games had to learn from movies that good stories, combined with exciting action, put people in their seats, and eventually, behind their joysticks. To me, it's more interesting if there's an epic storyline and, and I'm a hero and I'm, I'm on you know, Joseph Campbell's uh, you know, heroic quest. To be a storytelling medium, we've got to have characters. And if we're going to care about the characters, we've got to care about emotion. In the future, we will be a mass market form of entertainment and we will have the ability to delight 
and entertain customers who have all sorts of different kinds of tastes, much like television does today, much like books do today, music or movies. It's no different than any other creative me medium, in my opinion, and the very best artists will figure out how to make you cry. No, thank you. Thank you! To create emotion in video games, programmers needed to figure out how to make a hero from a handful of pixels. But they were limited by the lack of processing power. It was the imagination of a fledgling company and an untested game designer that would soon break the story barrier. Before the Japanese company Nintendo got into video games, they produced everything from plastic toys to playing cards. In the 1970s, the century-old company dabbled in the video game business by distributing the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan. In order to establish themselves as a real player in the growing arcade market, the CEO of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, sent his son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, to Washington State to create Nintendo of America. Mr. Arakawa said, okay, Radar Scope is going to be our Space Invaders. It's going to be our Pac-Man. It's going to be our big hit product. I'm going to order 3,000 of these from, from the Japanese uh, offices. Before those 3,000 games get there, the test unit that they had set up at an American uh, bar called the Spot Tavern in Seattle starts making less and less and less money. Then he realizes, oh no, I'm going to have all these Radar Scope games sitting around useless. What am I going to do? Nintendo of America decided to convert the unsold machines into new games. So all they needed to do was swap out a couple little pieces of paper, put in another game, and they had a totally new video game. What ends up happening is Yamauchi has no game designers. They're all working on other projects. And so he says, okay, well, we've got this guy named Miyamoto. And he, had, you know, and he went to him and said, design us a video game. <laughs> But Shigeru Miyamoto was not a game designer by trade. He was an artist and aspiring storyteller. A lot of the early people in the game industry are essentially technologists. They were tinkerers who now had computers to tinker on rather than, you know, a train set. But Miyamoto was an artist. He wanted to be a puppeteer. He wanted to be an entertainer of some kind. Miyamoto had a vision of a game that would be fun and playful. He was really trying to recreate that feeling of delight and wonderment and excitement that he had as a child exploring the world. He was also inspired by anime and manga, the distinctly Japanese forms of animation and comic books. Japanese anime, comic, manga are all very different from U.S. European taste. Kawaii. Japanese people grew up in the environment where many childish, adorable characters were seen. And it has been 40 years. Manga and anime have affected the Japanese a lot. It is one of our key cultural components. I think our desire for these entertainments like video games and manga and our immature tendencies have been somehow pre-programmed within ourselves. This is something that people innately want. To grow up as a child and have someone take care of us and not wanting to die, that is our utmost desire in life, I think. Our seeking of childish and this somewhat unconscious freedom is the reason why such culture has flourished here. Despite his complete lack of programming experience, Miyamoto set out to break new ground. I had an idea for a main character who was not really stunning, cool, or good-looking like Superman. Because characters in video games have to fit on a small screen. The design had to be less complicated. The humble little character Miyamoto created would soon change the entire face of the video gaming world. In 1981, Nintendo released Donkey Kong. The video gaming world had its first superstar, a portly plumber named Mario. 
was the first time it really was the most fleshed out character. The idea that a video game should not just be about Armageddon's coming and you have to shoot this down or defend yourself about this, but it actually is about a character and there's a sort of moral imperative that you have to save your girlfriend from this nasty gorilla. Well, if you go back to kind of American gaming in the, in the 70s, a lot of the games didn't have a central character. It was a square block, and you kind of had to imagine that that white blinking dot is a tennis racket, or a guy, or, you know, a, a boat or a car. The medium was so limited, it was so hard to build a character that was recognizable. And so Mario could only be a certain size. So Mario has a really big nose because it's easy to see a nose on, on somebody's face. Mario has a mustache because there weren't enough pixels to define a mouth underneath that nose. He wears a hat because it's really difficult to do hairstyles in, in, a, in an old arcade game like that. The red suit that, that Jumpman wore, that was a trick that the engineers at Nintendo taught him, that if you want one character to be recognized on the screen, put him in this crazy color. So he had to learn all of those things, but he brought with him the imagination of an artist and the way of storytelling that an artist would bring. And that was something very, very, very important to the industry, especially at that time. At that time, we would still draw rough sketches of the character and animation on paper and move them to get an idea of how it would look. So that's what we did. Like when he is running at breakneck speed, if he were to stop and turn suddenly, naturally he would slide. So we would try to add an animation of him sliding with a screech. Miyamoto also turned a few computer beeps into Donkey Kong's unforgettable soundtrack. Soon, everyone wanted in on the fun. Nintendo had its first hit, and Mario would soon become more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. Miyamoto turned moving pixels into Mario, an everyman's hero, who not only saved the princess, but also helped save the home video game business. It's a whole new playing field for the nation's nintendo -holic. There was a sense in the U.S. that home video games were dead, that the fad of the video game console was over. The companies all believed that the future was in personal computers. Atari was convinced. They took all Atari 2600, 7800, all that stuff off the market. They devoted the entire company's resources to making personal computers. More and more energy went into designing games for the emerging personal computer business, but Nintendo believed the home gaming console could still be resurrected. Nintendo started to bring it back, and they brought it back in the form that they called a toy, something designed and aimed at kids and kids and family. Nintendo released its new console in Japan under the name Famicom. The Nintendo Entertainment System was originally called Famicom for the family. And when the marketers came to bring it into the U.S., they realized they couldn't call it the Famicom Entertainment System to introduce it to America because they realized that the word family had negative connotations when associated with entertainment in this country. It was an uphill battle. But after a lot of convincing, toy store owners who'd been burned by the video game crash took a risk with Nintendo and put its console on their shelves in 1985. Nintendo also bundled Miyamoto's newest game, Super Mario Brothers, with the Nintendo Entertainment System. A winning combination. Super Mario Brothers basically took the unknown character from Donkey Kong, gave him a brother, and gave him a real purpose. So you would start at the left side of a level, and you always knew the end of the level is on the right. So you kind of forge forward the whole time, and you saw this whole world unfold as you're progressing through it. And just like in a narrative, you had the beginning of a level, and the end you would uh, get your chance at rescuing the princess. It really was Nintendo and the work of Shigeru Miyamoto, which the, the Super Mario Brothers, which was bundled with the Nintendo Entertainment System that reinvigorated the industry. If there had not been a Mario Brothers, if there had not been somebody who'd sort of had the vision to take video games to a new level where story was involved, it really might have gone the way of the hula hoop. Super Mario Brothers was a best-selling game worldwide. And more importantly, it also ushered in the new home video game revolution. What will the future bring from Nintendo? In America, the success of Super Mario Brothers marked the birth of characters and narrative in video games. 
Meanwhile, Shigeru Miyamoto was already envisioning another imaginative game world his players could explore and discover. A world reminiscent of his childhood in the hillsides near Kyoto. And he would go out exploring. And there was a system of caves, apparently, near where he lived. And he, so he one day brought a lantern and would go through the caves and explore different passageways and map them out. And so later on in life, when the technology became powerful enough, he immediately said, you know, I want to make a game that's like that about, about exploring. Many years ago, Prince Darkness Ganon stole one of the Triforce with power. With games like Donkey Kong, Mario at the end, Mario at the beginning is the same Mario. He has all the same power. Same thing with Super Mario Brothers. With Zelda, Link at the beginning is weak. He only has a certain amount of life energy. He has no weaponry at all. He has nothing. And at the end of Zelda, he has this array of weapons. He has all this life energy. And so that, that wasn't unique to The Legend of Zelda. Role-playing games had been around long before that. But it was the first game that married that really successfully with action. These are epic stories with classic themes of good and bad. The, the protagonist has to rescue somebody. You're a boy who has to go out and be brave and be better than you are when you start in order, not just for your own good, but for the betterment of your community. Legend of Zelda's intricate gameplay and dramatic musical score made for an unprecedented video experience, packed with action and emotion. So Legend of Zelda is a game that you will always hear people say it was the first game that they ever cried mm -hmm. when they played a game. It was very story-based. Your ability to really feel for the main character and for what he had to go through in order to better himself is something that really touched a lot of people. Legend of Zelda, released in 1987, became widely popular in the U.S., Europe, and Japan. I was one of the first ten people. They actually Players found that the game's emphasis on gaining power and acquiring treasures was perfectly in step with the times. Well, the 80s were, was definitely, uh, I think, the final uh, throwing off of any um, delusions about, you know, revolutionizing the establishment. You know, the, the, uh, the counterculture hippies now were the establishment and they embraced the toys of the establishment wholeheartedly. More money was, you know, often a goal in a game. The video games themselves were a toy of aspiration. I'm a video game addict. This is big business. It I'm became sort of business. one of the things that, as a new 80s adult, it was okay to go spend a lot of money on a video game console or on a computer to play games on. Uh, which was not something that previous generations would have embraced. You know, my father, as an accountant, would not have bought a computer to play games embraced. You know, my father, as an accountant, would not have bought a computer to play games on. He would have bought a computer to do spreadsheets on. Today, IBM made it official after months of hints and leaks to the press. The Goliath of Computers is coming out with its first home computer. It's called the PC Junior, unofficially the Peanut. While home entertainment systems may have dominated the market, computers would soon enter the same realm. In the early 1980s, the personal computer was introduced to the market. Computer games were unheard of because most people didn't have computers. Very, 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 very few people had computers, and most computers were in offices. You know, they were the huge, big IBM mainframes. And basically, the, the games were text, so the idea of actually putting pictures was um, not only innovative, but how do you do it? From their home in Southern California, Roberta and Ken Williams started Sierra Online. With limited technology, they brought graphics and stories to the first personal computer games. Well, when we started Sierra, the industry was just getting born. I mean, there was the very, very first personal computers. The um, Radio Shack had just introduced the TRS-80. Uh, Apple was out, and it really was hard. I mean, it was a um, pretty gutless machine. By now, I'm sure most joysticks have more computing power than the uh, first computers. In 1980, Roberta and Ken created Mystery House. It had no sound, no color, no animation, but it did have one feature that no other computer game had at the time. Graphics. Packaged in sandwich baggies, Mystery House quickly became a surprise bestseller. It sold more than 10,000 copies, an astounding achievement. 
Despite the fact that it offered almost no action, Mystery House was selling on a virtual one-to-one -one basis with home computers. For some reason, people who played games on their computers were of a different mindset than people who buy video game machines. They were more patient, so the idea of playing a game that would challenge you, you know, to think about solving a puzzle that was going to take a while to unfold wasn't something strange or weird to them. Even as home video consoles were flailing in 83, the Williamses were gaining ground in the budding PC game market. Their next graphic adventure was King's Quest. when a mouse and sound card were unheard of. The game featured never-before-seen 3D-like worlds and sound with characters the player controlled. If you look at our early games, they're comical because um, they're checkerboarded, you know, by um, taking all of the different limitations into account and putting dots in the right places. Like, you give something that if you squinted and stood way back from the screen, kind of looked like color. And... Um, kind of blew people away and that people were willing to tolerate such bad graphics, such uh, bad sound. You know, showed that there was an industry there, but it had yet to be born. Well, in the beginning, a lot of the Heroes Quest games were very focused on, on action. With some of the games like King's Quest, that action element really got thrown out in, in favor of exploration and kind of using your mind more to overcome hurdles. And also, it's, it, it was a departure in that you didn't control the character directly. You're kind of an onlooker, and the character does your bidding, but you're not completely connected to it. And so, not only was, was the story more intricate, you know, because of the slower pacing, you were able to tell more, you had more text in those games, but also the puzzles were much deeper. Although Miyamoto's console games were very different from the Williams' computer games, they both succeeded in combining traditional storytelling techniques with new technology. They took games and players where no one thought they could. But changing times and changing tastes would soon push storytelling and technology to a new edge. By the early 1990s, gamers grew up and they wanted entertainment that reflected their new mature selves. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, the decade was marked by economic globalization and an information revolution. Suddenly, people who grew up with only a handful of TV channels now had dozens on their cable connection. And with their new personal computers at home, gamers were also connecting to the Internet, able to access information from around the world in seconds. By sort of the, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, you were starting to see home consoles that were as powerful as what you were finding in an arcade. Now you were getting them in, you know, a little box. So, you know, people were starting to say, like, you know, the amount of technology that was needed to, you know, launch the space shuttle you could now get in your home computer. For many players, the appeal of traditional heroes was a thing of the past. The 90s was an edgier time and gamers wanted edgier characters. Well, I think what a lot of people didn't realize is that as the so-called Nintendo generation grew up, they continued to want to play games. The way somebody a little bit older watched TV or movies when they were a kid, when they got older, they still wanted to watch TV or movies, they just wanted adult fare. A company called Sega Enterprises delivered just that. Sega was a toy company that came out with arcade hits like Frogger in the 70s and later developed a console called the Sega Master System in the 80s. By marketing in regions where Nintendo did not, like Europe and South America, the console sold exceptionally well. But in 1983, Sega was hit hard by the video game crash. The manufacturers are still trying, those who haven't gone bankrupt, but the experts who follow the industry say it probably won't make a big comeback, that the game players have simply moved on to other things like video cassettes, records, tapes, even the movies. But Sega never gave up. Instead, it re-entered the recovering video game market and put out the Sega Mega Drive in Japan. This new 16-bit console rivaled Nintendo's 8-bit Famicom. With double the processing power 
Sega's system could handle superior sound and graphics. Back on 8-bit, you could do really simple uh, Donkey Kong, you know, Pong, things like that. When you got to 16-bit, now you can cover a much wider range of, of topics. You can have team sports, you can have really good uh, adventure games with storylines. You can do much better versions in all the different genres. This new technology arrived just in time. When the original Pong players grew up and had to go to work, game companies had to attract the younger generation of gamers who were now young men in their late teens and early 20s. The Sega Mega Drive was renamed Sega Genesis for the U.S. market. And to attract this slightly older buyer, the console was bundled with a fast-flying anthropomorphic hedgehog that would soon take the world by storm. In 1991, Sega of America had rebranded itself with a new game and a new mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. If Mario was cute and G and aw shucks, then Sonic the Hedgehog was liable to flip you the bird kind of a character that started to resonate with the, the angsty teens of the early 1990s. And so as they grew up, Sonic was more relevant to character to them. In the early 90s, Nintendo was still the dominant force. And we look back, and of course, driven by the, the cute little Italian plumber called Mario. But I think Sega identified that the consumer was looking for something else. In particular, with the launch of the Sega Genesis console, there was more processing power now that allowed characters, instead of jumping off mushrooms and bouncing and bouncing and having this side-scrolling effect, you had the ability now to deliver speed. Sonic was about, you know, mobility and getting around, and I think the spikiness of the haircut or the bristles on the hedgehog um, just reinforced that. Sega was looking at delivering an irreverent character that tied into the impish sense of, of mischief that teenage boys would have. Sonic was the perfect character. He is an anti-hero in, in that sense, and that he's not meant to really embody heroic qualities. You know, he has a kind of selfishness to him. But that's also what makes him fun. Players around the world were hooked, and not just on rascally rodents. They also found themselves compelled by a lovable loser named Larry. Larry Laffer was the title character of a series called Leisure Suit Larry, and the goal of the game was to help this balding, dorky, middle-aged man seduce attractive women. The tack that I took was to create an anti-hero, uh, a guy who would constantly be humiliated or insulted or put down. But if you played the game long enough, finally in the end he would persevere and you know have a just a short brief moment of happiness. Leisure Suit Larry at the time it came out, that was the first racy content on a computer. It was also one of the first games set in a real-world environment with realistic characters. I think Larry was the first game to use real uh, characters, real people, and present-day times and present-day settings, as opposed to the rut that most games were in, which is either medieval settings or space in the future. If I had no grand plan, I just knew that I didn't want to compete with those games or with those games, and therefore there was this big hole down the middle that seemed to me to be the perfect spot. In order to support these more lifelike worlds, companies had to develop new technology. In the early 90s, Nintendo partnered up with electronics giant Sony to develop CD-ROM technology for its console, but contract disputes destroyed the partnership. Instead of working with another game company, Sony continued its research and developed a standalone console on its own. They called it PlayStation. When Sony launched the PlayStation 1, they recognized that, you know what, there is an audience out there of the 18 to 21 year olds and, and older that still want to play video games. They grew up playing video games. They still want to play video games. But you know what? Now what Nintendo's doing, what Sega's doing, 
still feels kind of kitty to them. So Sony kind of filled that void for the older gamers by providing a system that looked a little bit more sophisticated. It was running on CDs, which at the time had this kind of technological advantage where you felt like, boy, you know, I'm getting a hi-fi piece of equipment. I'm not just playing this little kid's toy here. While Nintendo was still making games on cartridges that could only store 16 megabytes, Sony was making games on CDs that could store 650 megabytes. This allowed for far more complex graphics and games. You could have CD quality audio. Well done, Crash. I knew I could rely on you. You could have CG quality video. The range of possibility with more space on the storage medium, that increases the possibility for the game. Sony, to their credit, made video games a much cooler thing to be involved with, to play. We weren't dealing with just kiddie fare anymore. We were dealing with, you know, operatic masterpieces like Final Fantasy VII that really sort of dealt with death and betrayal and issues that certainly seemed more mature. And it opened up our product to so many new people who would now pick up a video game because there were aspects to it that felt like it was relevant to their life. The PlayStation basically reached the same level of penetration uh, in 10 years that it took the um, telephone to reach in 30 years. I mean, it just was sort of a sign of how ready people were to have something like this in their lives. It also brought us into this uh, time where more adult fare was being produced. From 1994 to 97, nearly 16 million PlayStation units found a permanent place in family rooms around the world. PlayStation came along at a time where the, the consoles moved into a world where you really had a 3D environment for the games. So Tomb Raider and Lara Croft and these you know, very complex environments where you could explore, that was a real hallmark of the PlayStation and at the time it really blew people's minds. The beginning of this movement brought one surprise hit that would truly revolutionize the medium. PlayStation brought video gaming into a new age, but it was Grand Theft Auto 3 that really changed the narrative. In this game, the hero wasn't interested in saving the princess. He was out to save his own skin, even if it meant breaking the law. You've got a handful of goals you're trying to achieve, but what's changed is the, is the play space. So they layer another fiction on top of it. So rather than being a slightly overweight plumber like Mario or uh, a faceless spaceship in asteroids, you know, you're uh, Carl Johnson. Or you're a gangster who just got out of prison and, you know, you're looking to get your life back together. And for today's audience, you know, sort of the post Gen X audience, post Oliver North, post Gulf War audience, you know, that's something they can relate to more than some of the traditional heroic fictions of uh, generations past. We're looking at a very tech-savvy consumer that can multitask, that wants interaction, that wants personalized experiences, doesn't want to be told what to watch, what to listen to, but wants it on his or her own terms. And that's what games deliver. In Grand Theft Auto, the player advances through the game by committing criminal acts. Grand Theft Auto is a game that allows for morally uh, the players to make different choices and they're not necessarily always going to be the choices we would like them to make. The fact that you could do something that is wrong and yet get some kind of reward in the game for doing it, in the same way that in real life somebody could burgle your house, which is clearly wrong, and yet uh, make some money from the goods they stole, which is clearly good in their eyes. That's real life, and, and uh, there are some games now that are kind of presenting those same conundrums to people. And it's interesting that people look at that and go, oh my god, that's horrible that they even allow you to make the same choices in the game that you can make in real life. You're unleashed into this game world, and you can try out the cars. You can try out how different they feel. And then you're like, hmm, what if I drive it off the bridge? It's like, oh, it blows up. Okay, let me drive it a little faster. And you try all these cool things that you wouldn't be able to do in real life, and hopefully aren't doing in real life. When the PlayStation 2 was released, the third edition of the Grand Theft Auto series emerged as the unexpected smash hit of 2001. Jumping for Coins was out. Jumping Innocent Bystanders was in. 
Grand Theft Auto 3 and its sequels really kicked off this movement of games that were becoming more Hollywood-like. You know, th these are games that kind of told about the life of crime, like you see in so many movies like Goodfellas or shows like The Sopranos. And it had this incredible all-star cast that Rockstar, the developer, didn't even hype up. They didn't even want to take advantage of. They just wanted to have this really awesome cast. You know, people like Samuel L. Jackson. I'll take that, Hernandez. Hey, that's my paper, man. That's money. This is drug money. And all these great names are just kind of behind the scenes doing this video game. And it also was cinematic because it told the story where you, you got to see your character just start out as maybe a small time thug and slowly moving up the ranks, gaining more respect of his peers and fighting other crime bosses. So it was it had a real Hollywood kind of cinematic presentation to it, but at the same time was a pure video game. The Grand Theft Auto series, created by Rockstar Games, started a trend of movie-worthy storylines, real Hollywood stars, and legitimate soundtracks. In Grand Theft Auto, one of the cool things was you had a radio station, and the radio station you could tune in, and there were all these great songs from the 80s that gave the game a real mood. Uh, you know, pop songs, um, and you know they'd get you know really talented voiceover. They'd write the dialogue in a short, punchy way that you know, just sort of worked. So they didn't get trapped in sort of the Final Fantasy approach of these long, attenuated cutscenes. It's very short, in and out, and uh, you know use the other things besides the visuals to help bring the world to life. I, I really think this shows that gaming culture is becoming much more of a mainstream culture and lots of other kinds of media are interested in getting some of the passion that gamers have and capitalizing on it. With video games looking and sounding more like movies, they were finally starting to earn Hollywood's respect. When you look at games that are action-adventure type games that have these incredibly lush environments, and that from 2D to 3D to HD has all happened within a decade and really has propelled video games to now part of Hollywood when we think of the experiences you're delivering, the licenses that Hollywood movie studios are now very eager to get into a video game business, and the impact that we have overall in the world of entertainment. We are really focusing on driving a 20 to 40 hour interaction with a 25 year old male that's no longer watching television, they're playing television. The sense of participation and heroism that you get out of winning a video game is much more powerful than you get from watching some character in a movie be heroic or victorious. I think up until recently it was we as an industry were licensing movie rights and then paying a large amount of money at times to then do the game version of a particular movie as it was either being released or, or maybe three or four months later. Hollywood now recognizes that that male consumer is not going to the theater. They're at home, they have their high definition TV screen, they're connected to millions of people through Xbox Live, and now I think the shoe is on the other foot. Video games are becoming more mainstream with in-depth storylines, complex characters, and realistic graphics. We need some help here. But unlike Hollywood, in video games, good looks can only go so far. At the dawn of the 21st century, the days of the little man with the big mustache were over. New consoles like the Sony PlayStation had revolutionized the industry. The computational power that you have today in modern consoles, be it the PlayStation or the Xbox, is several orders of magnitude more powerful than what we had in the first video game consoles, like with the Pong machine. Or it's really like comparing the level of technology embodied in a modern skyscraper to Stonehenge. I remember, and a lot of people remember, playing called Tecmo Bowl from the gate publisher Tecmo. And it was a very compelling game, but it wasn't exactly high-tech from the point of view of the way it looked and feel. And it really didn't look like an NFL game. Fast forward to where we are today, we're now looking at games, in particular EA's Madden Football, that if you walk past the screen in the living room and you're not paying attention, as far as you're concerned, there's a real NFL game going on there. 
Live from Foxborough. High fidelity graphics allowed players to become real sports heroes. Regardless of a gamer's own physical skills, he or she could now master any sport virtually. The new sports games give players a, a, a sense of power over, you know, their heroes because all of a sudden you have all these players' faces and their names and it's all real and the rosters are all there. So they can almost move these guys around like, you know, toy soldiers on a battlefield. And, you know, that's a pretty heady experience. For many years now, Electronic Arts has had this slogan about EA Sports, if it's in the game, it's in the game. Where that really originated was with my passion for authenticity. In order to get the video game characters to move like real athletes, game developers used motion capture, a technology borrowed from Hollywood. Motion capture is, um, is a process by which you put um, uh, markers on a, on a person and then you, you capture their, their movement data and that gives you the ability to get very realistic, you know, gross uh, joint motion. One of the things you see in real life basketball is that any one move, everyone on the court reacts to it in some way. And EA said, well, we're going to try and take advantage of that. So they actually motion captured 10 players at a time. Uh, on the court in addition to the individual motion capture sessions they were doing and so when you play the game you saw it it made a big difference you know you made one little move and everyone responded to it in some way shape or form so you know it, it puts you in the game more now you have so much computing power rendering these environments that you have something that's almost like hyper realistic and you know you can see the the players eyeballs and you know you can't even see those things you know when you're watching real sports events on TV Here's Howard. Count the basket. However, by trying to create more lifelike graphics in video games, sports heroes actually started looking more dead than alive in what technologists called the uncanny valley, a term to describe the repulsive response a human has to a robot's almost human or uncanny looks. If you can't communicate with characters in, in only a very shallow way, <clears throat> how are we going to care very much about them? We're going to have no problem just killing them and running them over with our virtual cars. But once we can speak in our own words and they can really hear us and there's an actual conversation going on, then we are going to start feeling more emotional and we may uh, get to the point of tears uh, when, we, when we interact with them. The gold standard has become whether a game can make you cry. And some people think it can't, and there's no games make you cry except when you can't get it to work. Others think that games are already making us cry on a regular basis. But crying becomes emblematic of capturing the human experience. It's about broadening the range of what a game can do, what kinds of worlds it can bring into our living rooms. In the early days, we had a hard time showing human beings, so games were about aliens from outer space. But then we figured out how to show humans on the screen, and you started to get more games about, uh, about human beings. Now the holy grail is kind of emotion, you know, characters that feel fully fleshed out and like real human beings. That's really the next challenge for us. Until then, perhaps the rendering doesn't always have to happen on the screen. It can happen in the imagination of the player like it did with the first low-resolution graphics or text-based adventure games. But whether or not it makes the player cry, a video game is still a powerful medium. After all, where else can an average person become a hero with the push of a button?